As we come today to the book of Ezra, our subject is the Word of God. The Victorian era is now conceded to be the high water mark in the history of the British Empire. It was during this period that Great Britain reached its zenith in power, in greatness, in extension, and vastness. It's during this period that the cliché was coined, the sun never sets on the Union Jack. It was during this period that this nation came to a place of prestige that probably no other nation has enjoyed on the top side of this earth. Granted that this period was a bit stuffy and stodgy and sticky and superficial, it still remains that this nation reached its greatness during this period. It was the finest hour of a great nation. After this period, there has been a steady decline, so that today even the best friends of Great Britain will tell you that they are a second-rate nation. The nation that one time it was said, Britannica rules the waves, has not yet put a Sputnik in orbit. There is one area that they have not yet explored. The reason is that Great Britain is on the way down. During this period of greatness when Queen Victoria ruled, an African prince was presented to Queen Victoria. And uh, while he was there, he made this request of her. He said, Would you tell me what is the secret of England's greatness? And Queen Victoria procured a very beautifully bound copy of the Word of God, and she presented it to this prince from Africa, desired him to accept it and to read it, and she said, this is the secret of England's greatness. The German nation made significant advances in the scientific field and greater strides in the realm of commercial expansion and colonizing ventures than any other nation. Historians agree today that the beginning of this rocket climb was the translation of the Bible by Martin Luther into the language of the people, so that this nation had access to the Word of God and the humblest citizen of that great nation read the Bible. But this period was abruptly ended with the advent of destructive higher criticism of the school first of the graf Welthausen hypothesis that made its attack upon the Old Testament and the tubigen bauer hypothesis which made its attack upon the New Testament. And before long, Germany exchanged the Bible for Mein Kampf and exchanged God for Hitler. They got cheated in the bargain, by the way. My beloved, today you and I live in a nation that was founded and made great and strong by men and women who had a profound respect for the Word of God. I want to give you this morning two or three quotations from men that are still considered good Americans. Thomas Jefferson once said, I have always said and always will say that the studious perusal of the sacred volume will make better citizens, better fathers, and better husbands. And Daniel Webster said this, and will you listen carefully? 
I have read it through many times. And I now make a practice of going through the Bible once a year. It's the book of all others for lawyers as well as divines. And I pity the man who cannot find in it a rich supply of thought and rules for conduct. It was Woodrow Wilson who said this, I would be afraid to go forward if I did not believe that there lies at the foundation of all our schooling and all our thought the incomparable and unimpeachable Word of God. I had the privilege as a seminary student of preaching in the historic First Presbyterian Church in Augusta, Georgia. And the first Sunday I stood in that pulpit that's sort of like a, well, it's one that's way to the side with big high, in fact, they ought to put sleeves in it, it's a small, and you stand in there and preach. And as I stood at the side, I could see the pew to my left, and I could see there was a bronze plaque on it. And I went down immediately after that first service to see what it said. And it said that here is where Woodrow Wilson sat as a boy with his mother when his father was pastor of this church. And this man believed implicitly in the Word of God. May I say to you this morning that you and I have lived in the finest hour of this nation, but already our sun is beginning to set. Many today in high places, men that are placed in high positions as statesmen, today as thinkers, as scientists, as military men, are saying that we now are on the way down and we're on the way out. We are following the same course that Rome followed and other great nations of the past. I do not know whether that is true or not. I can devoutly pray it's not true. But one thing is sure, the Bible is losing its place of importance and significance in America today. Oh, I know it's true that the Bible, the Gideon Bible, is still in hotels and motel rooms, but so is the Book of Mormon, and so is Ms. Mary Baker, Eddie Fry Glover's book, Science and Health, Key to the Scriptures. Many today still profess to believe it's the Word of God, but they treat it as casually as the telephone book, the Sears and Roebuck catalog, and the current issue of any popular magazine. Some give it today lip service, but they know more about Lolita, the Reader's Digest, and the local paper than they do about the Word of God. My beloved, the Word of God can make a nation great. It has. It can enlighten individuals. It has. And it alone can bring sustenance and strength and spiritual stamina to Christians. It has and it does today. Thy word is a lamp under my feet, a light under my path. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in the heavens. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Those are quotations from Psalm 119. And the man who wrote Psalm 119 was not David. This great psalm that's in the center of the Bible, it's the longest chapter in the Bible, every verse in it with the exception of probably four, and I personally believe it can be sustained, that every verse in it mentions the Word of God. It's the finest tribute that's ever been given to the Word of God. I say to you this morning, David did not write that psalm. 
Ezra wrote that psalm. It was Ezra, the priest and the scribe, who wrote that psalm. Now, my beloved Ezra not only wrote that psalm and the book of Ezra, but he wrote First and Second Chronicles. The two men in the Old Testament that are connected more with the Word of God and associated with the Word of God are Moses and Ezra. And Ezra can be compared to Moses. The chief rabbi in New York City, or maybe it was Cincinnati uh, several years ago, was asked who he considered to be the greatest Jew. He said, I consider Moses. Now, there's some disagreement with him on that. Personally, I would disagree with him. But the point is, he says that Moses is the greatest. May I say to you, if you put Moses first, you will have to put Ezra second. These two men made the greatest contribution on the human plane to the Word of God, my beloved. Moses, at the very beginning, wrote the first, and Ezra, at the very end of the Old Testament, he wrote the last book. For well, Malachi is actually not the last book. Ezra wrote last. Moses first and Ezra last, and these two men are a thousand years apart, and these two men put quotation marks around the Word of God, and they say one thing, this is the Word of God. And Dr. Warfield probably had the greatest intellect of any American so far. Oh, I know there are few in our universities today that think they have a greater intellect than this man, but no man's ever topped Dr. B.B. Warfield. This is what he said, The Bible is the Word of God in such a sense that whatever it says, God says. That's what Moses said. That's what Ezra said. That the Bible is the Word of God in such a way that whatever it says, God says. Now, Ezra apparently arranged the Old Testament canon, and we've lost sight of him and his contribution because of the fact that this man hides in the background. He didn't call attention to himself. Ezra called attention to the Word of God, my beloved, and he put the emphasis upon the Word of God. And this morning, I would like very briefly to have you note three things that are identified with Ezra. First, attention to the Word of God. Second, attitude toward the Word of God, and third, action from the Word of God. Those are the three things, very briefly, we want to note. I do not have a text, but here is a verse that we shall use a great deal. It's Ezra 7, 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Now, Ezra was born during the captivity. He was born in slavery down in the land of Babylon by the rivers of Babylon where the harps had been put on the willow trees, where they no longer were singing a song, where these people now were grinding under the heavy load that the Babylonians had put upon them as the Egyptians had done previously. And in among these people there came this man Ezra. He was of the tribe of Levi. He was a priest in that tribe, and interesting enough, he is of the family of the great high priest. The very first verse of chapter 7 tells us that he was in the line that went back through Hilkiah. Hilkiah was the priest during the time that Josiah was the king, one of the good kings. 
He is uh, one of the men who brought the Word of God back into high position among the people and brought revival thereby by introducing the Word of God again. I say Ezra's in a very good line. And then you trace him on back till you get to verse 5 and you find out the son of Aaron, the chief priest, so that Ezra was able to trace his lineage directly back to the high priest. And apparently, he would have been in the succession of high priests and would have been one of them. But he never served in that office. And the reason that he never served in that office, he was born down yonder in Babylon, in slavery, and in that place, Well, there was no place for him to serve. You see, the priests were to serve in the temple. And there's no temple. It's been destroyed. And all the priests are out on strike. Nowhere could you find a priest to serve in that day. To begin with, there's no place to serve. So this man, Ezra, did something very interesting. He gave himself to the study of the Word of God. You want to know how he passed his time while the other people down yonder by the rivers of Babylon were crying out, while they were singing the blues? This man was giving himself to the study of the Word of God. And we're told this Ezra went up from Babylon and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. This man, you see, was a man who was a ready scribe. He had made himself proficient in the study of the law. And that means all of the Old Testament books that had preceded him. And this man is the one who is the founder of the office that we know as scribe. Now, by the time you get to the Lord Jesus Christ in that day, This order of scribes had become very prominent, very influential, and very far from God. And we get a bad impression of them, because at that time they had put the emphasis upon the intellectual side, just to have a knowledge of the Bible, to be able to split hairs and to argue about it was all that they did. And the Lord Jesus said to them, "'Ye search the Scriptures.'" And these men knew the the Bible, that is, they knew the mechanics of it, and they knew the words of it. They were so well acquainted with it that in that day it was in scrolls hanging in the temple, and it is said that the scribes played a little game. That is, when they weren't busy. And one of the things they did was to take a thong, and they'd push it into the scroll, and they'd all come up and look at it, And guess what word it stopped on? Some of them could tell you not only the word it stopped on, but the letter it stopped on. They knew that scroll. They knew the Word of God. They had a head knowledge of it. And when wise men came to Jerusalem and said, Where is he that's born King of the Jews? May I say to you today, if the average Christian was asked that, he'd spend probably half a day. Where in the world is it? Where does it say that? These men, without batting an eyelash, could tell you exactly where he was to be born. They didn't have to run to get the Word of God. They had it. They could quote it. They knew it. And it is said that some of them could quote it verbatim from beginning to end. They knew it. But it's only intellectual. It had had never found their hearts. They knew where the Messiah was to be born, but they had no heart concern or desire to go down there and see him. You always wonder why one of the wise men wasn't approached by one of the scribes who said to him, Say, could I hitchhike a ride on the back of your camel? I'd like to go down and see him. We've been looking for him here a long time, and we know some more things about him when he comes And we may be able to help you on the way down. We can give you more scripture than he could have. But not one of them had any heart interest in him. And I'm afraid today that there are a great many professing Christians 
Yes, they may know something about the Bible, may know many things, but they don't know the one that's the hero of this book. And they don't know him. Paul says, it's the ambition of my life that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. And so this man, Ezra, was the one who had prepared his heart in order that he might know the Word of God. And he prepared himself to teach the Word of God. So much so that when he got back to the land, and he didn't return until 75 years after Zerubbabel and Haggai and Zechariah, and when he got back there, they were all dead. And this man was used of God, as we shall see tonight, to bring about probably the greatest revival in the history of the world. It was at the deadest moment of the history of the world. And we are told over in Nehemiah, the eighth chapter, listen to this, verse 2, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And then I drop down to verse 8, and he says, So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And that's the greatest Bible reading in the history of this world. Ezra got up and read on a pulpit of wood at the water gate, and as he read, the priests were all out in the congregation, and there were evidently pretty close to 50,000 people. And it was relayed by the different priests. They had repeated. And then other priests went up and down the aisles and said, Brother, did you get that? Did you understand it? And the fellow said, No, I first time I ever heard it. I don't get it. And then they would, Ezra would wait and they would explain it to that brother. And somebody over here would say, Well, I, I didn't understand that. What, didn't, what did Moses mean by that? What does God mean by that? And then that was explained. Wasn't that a wonderful way to teach the Word of God? That's the way it was done at that time. And it was led by a man, my beloved, who gave attention to the Word of God. You have to give attention to it if you're going to know it. I think maybe that somewhere today in America, God may have a young man, and that young man will be the instrument that will save America and that young man may even today be preparing, be prepared by the Holy Spirit. And he may be studying the Word of God as no one else is studying it today. And the Spirit of God opening up his mind and heart. And one of these days he'll come out. He'll be God's man. It was Dwight L. Moody. Before he died said, the next revival, if there be another revival, will be a revival of the Word of God. My beloved, the world is waiting today for that revival. It has not yet come. Because the professing Christians today are not giving attention to the Word of God. They're not like the Berean Christians or the Sunday school classes over America, and they call themselves the Bereans. And they're no more like the Bereans than the man in the moon's like Bereans. What they do, they call themselves Bereans, but the Bereans search the Scriptures daily to see if these things were true, my beloved. Paul, writing to a young preacher, said two things to him. He said, give attendance to reading. And then he said, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And Paul and Peter in their swan song, Paul in 2 Timothy, Peter in 2 Peter, they turn to the Word of God, and both of them say this, that the last days will come and there will be a great apostasy. And the only recourse that God's children will have will be the Word of God. Peter says, ye have a more sure word of prophecy, and ye do well that you take heed when you see the day coming. And 
Paul said all scriptures given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for anything that can come up in your life, my beloved. Unless God's people in America turn to the Word of God, Ichabod is written across the escutcheon of the church and also of this land of ours, for this land of ours, as Woodrow Wilson said, that he would be fearful if he felt this nation had gotten away from that book. That's the reason democracy won't function today in the hands of godless men. It never was intended to. Democracy was that which was coined and brought into being, conceived and brought to birth by men who believed in the Word of God, my beloved. And no other crowd can make it function. We need to give attention to the Word of God. The second, this man Ezra's attitude toward the Word of God. And let me turn back to our verse again, Ezra 7.10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Isn't that a lovely thing? He prepared his heart. And then when he gathered the people together for a great prayer meeting, in chapter 9, verse 4, this lovely thing is said, Then were assembled unto him every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel. They trembled at the words of the God of Israel. You see, not only did he have a preparation of mind, where he knew the Bible, but this man had a preparation of heart. He had a heart for the Word of God. His attitude toward it was one that it is the Word of God. And he gathered around him those people who believed it was the Word of God, and they actually trembled at it. How many people today really tremble at the Word of God? We say today, oh, we believe it's the Bible. As one man said, if this is the Word of God then nothing else matters. And if it's not the Word of God, then it doesn't matter at all. And many Christians today are acting as if it doesn't matter at all. My beloved, this is the Word of God, and it must have a profound effect upon us before it can have any effect upon anyone else. It must bless us before it blesses others. Somebody said to me, he said, don't you uh, sometimes get just a little tired going to conference after conference speaking and not listening to anyone else? And I want to tell you I do. That's one reason I like to go to conferences where there are other speakers, where I can hear them. But I have learned this, that when the Word of God flows through you, it's, it's like going out in a parking lot. You can go by and put your hand on the radiator and you can tell which car has been running. And you can tell which has been standing there. You see, if the Word of God has been moving through your heart and life, it's going to warm you up. It's going to have some effect upon you. And my beloved, today we need that kind of an attitude toward the Word of God. It needs to have an effect upon us. No wonder a lot of Sunday school teachers saying, How in the world can a holy interest get your interest first? If this thing has a profound effect upon you, if it grips your attention, if your attitude to it is that it's the Word of God, then it'll affect somebody else. And no method is a substitute for that. No method. We must be convinced that it's the Word of God. My beloved, I say this kindly, but no man who has any doubt whether this is the Word of God ought to ever enter a pulpit. Don't misunderstand me this morning. I think any man has a right to doubt the Word of God. That's his business. We live in a country where you have a perfect right to disbelieve this book. But I say this, you don't have a right to enter a pulpit. You have a right to believe and disbelieve, but you don't have a right to enter a pulpit where the Bible is supposed to be believed, and then declare your unbelief in a very cogent, subtle manner. No Sunday school teacher has any right to teach 
that has any doubts. And no officer of any church has any right to be an officer of the church if he has any doubts. And if we have any here like that, they ought to hand in their resignation before the sun goes down. You've got any doubt about this book? This happens to be the Word of God, and until we have that kind of an attitude toward it, my beloved, it'll never affect anyone else. We reveal by our attitude toward this book whether we really believe it or not. You just, you just give yourself away. You can't help it. It's your attitude toward the Word of God. It was said of John Wesley, he was a man of one book. And if you think he was a narrow, limited man, may I say he got up every morning at 5 o'clock, and before breakfast he had read the Bible in five different languages. Any man that can do that it has a pretty broad base on which to operate. He was one of the most intelligent of men on top side of this earth, but he had a reputation as being a man of one book, and he wanted it that way because he was emphasizing this book. What is your attitude today toward the Word of God? Oh, you say, I believe it. I'm not asking that now. What's your attitude toward it? My beloved, do you tremble at its Word? Does it have any effect upon you? Does it grip your heart and grip your life? This is the Word of God. I close now. Action from the Word of God. I come back to our verse. Will you listen to Ezra? For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. To do it. And to teach in Israel statutes and judgment. He not only came to it to find out what it said, but it had an effect upon him. Not only did he have an attitude toward it, a one of reverence, and trembled at its words, but I tell you, it's the thing that was his dynamo for action. It's the thing that motivated him. It's the thing that sent him out into life. That's the reason Ezra did so much. That's the reason that in the most barren period in the history of the world, here stood a man that was unmoved and unaffected, but why went on around him? Why? Because he is motivated. And his point was not only to study it, not only to read it, but to do it. And you can become a bibliolatry. We have a lot of folk. I knew a young preacher. He and I were in school together. Everywhere he went, he took the Bible... I found out later that one of the reasons he took it to the doctor's office was the doctor always gave him a discount when he saw he had the Bible. But he always took the Bible with him. It's, always, it's very pious to lug it around. And may I say to you that this morning, that boy is more ignorant of the Bible than any person that I know of. He always lugs it around. And you know why? Oh, his Bible's well thumbed. But he's never even thought in terms that Ezra did. He, he set his mind, his heart, to know it and to do it. To do it. Whatever it said, he'd do. My beloved, there's nothing that will short-circuit the power of, of the Word of God as in action. Failure to do what it said. Insulated and separated from the power of God today because of a lack of obedience. You remember that when John on the Isle of Patmos, given those wonderful things, he was given a little book and he said, When I ate it, it was sweet as honey to my mouth, but it was bitter to my belly. You know why? He was just not a spiritual gourmet. Wonderful to go to prophetic conferences and wonderful to study prophecy, but is it affecting your life? And believe me, it gets bitter to a lot of people when they start digesting it, when they begin to translate it into energy, into life, and put it into shoe leather. It becomes a different thing then. Oh, I love to study prophecy. 
You do? Has it transformed your life? That's what John meant when he said that. Jeremiah had the same experience with the Bible. The eating of it is sweet, but the digesting of it, when it's translated out into energy, that's when it becomes bitter. My beloved, God never speaks to an unwilling heart. I don't care how much you read the Bible. He doesn't speak to an unwilling heart. Abraham was never appeared to by the Lord when he was out of the land and out of the will of God. God told him, God appeared to him and gave him a revelation and said, Abraham, you get to this place. And from that moment on, God never appeared to him till he got to that place. And when he left that place, God never appeared to him again. The whole thought is that unless we live up to the light we have, God has no more light for us. And that's one of the reasons that this book is nullified for many Christians today. It's the very simple reason it's a closed book, because they have no notion of following it at all. If any man will do his will, the Lord Jesus said, he'll know whether my doctrine's of God or whether it's not. The greatest proof of the Bible, my beloved, is to start putting it in action. James, in his practical manner, says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. And this man Ezra put it into practice. When Ezra went to the king and asked that he might be, might be permitted to lead a delegation of the priests back to Jerusalem, he waxed rather eloquent. In fact, he went overboard, went a little too far. Well, you notice what he did. He says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forswear him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Now, Ezra said, When I went into the king, I was so anxious that he'd grant permission for me to lead back this delegation that I went overboard. I actually, I said this to him, The hand of our God is on us, and he'll take care of us. And he says, the king was swept away by my eloquence, and he said, go ahead. And then I got to thinking about it, as was said, and I thought, say, we ought to have some soldiers to go along to protect us. And as was said, I didn't dare ask him because I'd already told him God would take care of us. And I didn't dare ask him for soldiers. You see, a little later on, Nehemiah went up, and he had half of the army of the Persian Empire to lead him on his way, but Ezra didn't have anyone. May I say that I think that's the proof that it's not really the method. <laughs> oh, how we go for methods today. It's just got to be done a certain way, and if it's not done a certain way, it's not the latest. Well, may I say to you, Ezra did it one way, and Nehemiah did it another way. Nehemiah had half the army of Persia to take him up, and poor Ezra, the priest, he had popped off. Before the king, he said, you know, God's for us and God's with us. The king said, go ahead. So he said, I better not ask him then for any soldiers. So he said, I gathered together the people and I lifted, we fasted and, and we rent our clothes and we asked God to protect us and he did. You see, this man was continually putting the word of God to a test and putting it in action. He found out it was true for that very reason. And it's the reason that this man could write, my beloved, in Psalm 119. And will you listen to this? You must remember, the man who wrote Psalm 119 knew what he was talking about from experience. Listen. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. 
and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments, so shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. This man says, I have found out that when you go and commit yourself to God and lay this matter before him in the situation that I is in, you can count on God to lead you through. My beloved, Ezra had seen this book in action. He'd seen it tested. And God still sends out the invitation, taste of the Lord and see that he's good. This word, my beloved, is still the living Word of God with power. And not only that, but 1,900 years ago there came to this earth one who's very similar to this book. This book is a God book. It's a man book. And 1,900 years ago there came to this earth the God-man. By the incarnation he took upon himself human flesh, and John says the Word was made flesh. God's Word, God translated into humanity, if you please. God put in a person so you could know Him, my beloved. The Word was made flesh, pitched His tent here among us, and we beheld His glory, glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And this morning, to know this book is to know Him, the Word of God who came 1,900 years ago, not only to reveal God but to redeem man. And He died on a cross to pay the penalty of your sin and mine, put in a tomb but the grave could not hold Him. He burst the bands asunder and He came up in mighty power. And God today is speaking to the world through that person in this book. It's God's Word. I close with this. Dr. Forbes Winslow is a name that the psychiatrist today knows if he knows anything about psychiatry. For this was one of the earliest physicians who treated diseases of the mind. He goes way back to the days of Napoleon III. In fact, a young Frenchman came to him who was mentally deranged, and he brought with him a letter from the Emperor Napoleon III asking Dr. Winslow if he would not treat this young man. Dr. Winslow, after he had examined him and talked with him, and I suppose he's the first man that ever used the psychiatrist's couch. He began to probe into this man's subconscious. And finally this man said to him, he says, I'm an infidel. My father was an infidel. But he said, you know, every night as I lie down to sleep, there's a question that comes up in my mind. Eternity. Where will I spend eternity? Eternity. And he says, because of that, I can't sleep. Dr. Winslow turned to him and said, Young man, I cannot help you. But I can recommend a physician to you that can help you. And taking down from his desk a well-worn Bible, he turned to the passage and read, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised with our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The young man curled up his lip in scorn. He says, you, a brilliant scientist, don't believe that book, do you? And Dr. Winslow said, young man, I fully believe in Jesus Christ, and I believe the Bible. And believing in Christ and believing in the Bible has kept me from becoming as you are. The answer to America today and to you and to me 
is a return to the Word of God. And the hero of this book, the one that it presents, it's a hymn book. It's all about H-I-M, him. Job says that I might find him. And Philip said, we have found him. Have you found him this morning? He's the answer to your problem and my problem. Shall we pray? With our heads this morning bowed in prayer, very briefly, I'm wondering if you are here on the threshold of this new year with its uncertainty. There's uncertainty for you in this life and uncertainty may be for you after this life for no one of us know what a day will bring forth. James says our life is just like a fog, a bank of fog on the side of a mountain driven away by the oncoming sun. So uncertain are things. May I say to you this morning, there's only one thing sure, only one thing today that you can hold on to. God says, I'm going to shake all things that you might know that there are some things that are unshakable. This book is unshakable. The Lord Jesus Christ is unshakable. Men down through the centuries have found it so. You can find it so. I'm not talking to you about a theory today. I'm talking to you about reality. It can become yours if you want it.